welcome to this morning's board meeting. Um, just a reminder that um, the audio is going to be broadcast live from this board meeting. We were hoping that the um, whole meeting, including the visuals, would have uh, broadcast, but we've had some uh, broadband difficulties this morning. Um, but we're doing our best to make sure at least the um, discussion is um, accessible to those who wish to um, access the, uh, the dialogue. Uh, we start this morning's meeting by uh, reflecting on uh, the further lives that have been lost to COVID um, since our last board meeting and of course send our deep condolences to each and every one of those families. We also reflect on the um, increasing numbers of uh, people discharged, medically fit, um, home and of course wish them all the best in their ongoing recovery. Um, on that note, of course, um, it's a great pleasure um, to thank once again all our colleagues um, in the Trust for everything that they're doing so magnificently to look after our patients and the wider community at this time. Um, and a deep uh, thanks and gratitude and admiration from us for all you're achieving. Um, it's really impressive. I'm equally pleased that today we're going to have a paper on restoration and recovery from COVID and we'll have an opportunity to think um, a little bit about what that's going to look like and uh, we can see that there's some uh, deep thinking and some excellent planning already going into that. Because of course as a trust, um, you know, when this uh, period has passed, it will be important that we reflect on our performance not only in respect of COVID but in terms of total mortality. Uh, because, of course, that's what we're trying to protect our um, patients and uh, the community we serve. So uh, with those acknowledgements and thanks, um, I just ask if we have um, any apologies, John? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Thank you very much. Um, and then that brings me, if I may, to item two, the register and declarations of interest. Um, could you please indicate if you have any changes that you want to bring to our attention, either in respect of the register or in respect of an interest in any of the items on today's agenda? Thank you very much. Um, and that brings us on to the staff story. Um, this is a staff story relating to the Women's Health Unit. We've had the synopsis um, and I'm going to go to Lynn um, in the uh, first instance to introduce it, please. Shall I introduce it, Helen? It's Zoe. Oh, yes. As a staff, as a staff story. Is that, that OK? Fine. Of course it is. Um, so thank you and welcome, Justine and Keeley. I believe we have you connected. Uh, they're connected, but they're saying they can't hear. I'm just going to do a test, if that's OK with you, Zoe, and ask, um, ask them to speak now to see if we can hear them. I've just sent a text message, so carry on introducing, and if they interrupt, then we know they can hear us. OK, that's fine. Um, so this is a, a staff story which was originally scheduled to come to board in March. Um, obviously, the March agenda changed quite a lot because that was the early days of the COVID pandemic. Um, I think the fact the story is coming today is quite timely. Board colleagues will have seen there's a paper later on in the agenda around learning from the winter plan. Um, and certainly from talking to Justine, I think there's a lot in there and from hearing her her reflections and her feelings and those of the team that really brings some of that learning to life so I, I think there is, is quite a good connection having the two on the agenda today um, and i'm struggling to uh, get them to it's if, angie if they're in the corporate meeting room, i could always come out of my office and sort of sit to one side in my office and they could come in here and be socially distant yeah, do you want to go fetch Hi. them? Excuse me, I'll just go and fetch them. Um. Apologies all, um, people are just moving rooms so that we can make sure everyone's connected. Can I just take the opportunity to point out the meeting has been recorded today and will be placed on the internet later. Thank you. 
Morning, Justine and Keely. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Sorry about the technical difficulties in the court. We could, we'd got it set up, but we just couldn't see or hear it. Well, we could hear, but not see anybody. Go ahead. Good morning. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, in your Thank absence, you. Zoe gave us a brief introduction, Justine. Um, but you know, we're very keen to hear. We've had a synopsis, but we're very keen to hear the story in your own words, so to speak. Okay. So I, I've got myself here and, and Keely Woodward as well, who's um, a staff nurse from PACU. So we felt it was important to share the story from both my perspective as a matron, but also from a, a staff who, a staff member who was recruited to the service. So I'll talk for a, a little bit, and then if if I just pass you on to Keely from her perspective. So back in sort of the end of October, I was asked to um, recruit a, a, a number of staff to enable us to open the women's health unit inpatient beds um, on the at the beginning of January. So very, very short time scales, um, about nine weeks from me being asked to do that to actually as needing to open those beds. So, you know, to, to recruit what in in the end was around 16 staff was was quite a challenge but we sort of set about doing that um and worked incredibly hard to get to the point where we you know by the end of november we'd almost recruited all the staff that we needed and and i was so proud that we'd recruited differently so that we could try and speed up the process um and i, I did a lot of engagement with the staff on the women's health unit had who had previously experienced the bays being open and and hadn't been overly positive about what had happened but i sort of tried to reassure them that we would learn from what had happened and we would use that to our advantage and, and i feel that we did that um obviously everybody will know that the beds opened early um and that was you know again we were incredibly proud to achieve that and, and we could see the, the benefits for, for the gynaecology and the surgical ladies that were going to be under our care. Um, lots of comings and goings, opening, closing during December and then obviously at the end of December um, on the Monday the 27th, um, as I think it was, um, the decision was made for those ladies to move to Basel and that's where the real issues were in the communication or lack of communication that happened. Um, I think I've described to, to different people, perhaps who are listening today, how that made me feel personally uh, and professionally. Um, I felt that, that that the whole thing was just done so so quickly, and 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 it felt like we'd been sort of ransacked almost. It, it was really really quite distressing for, for patients and staff um lots of difficulties over the next couple of weeks as, as it became clear that the women's health unit in patients really wasn't going to exist and the, the staff were moved um, to basel ward um and then i was asked to manage both both areas which again was incredibly challenging and not what i'd been asked to do um, so yeah, lot, lots of difficulties from from a managerial point of view that impacted me um, and, and the staff who I'd recruited and the staff on the women's health unit. So a, a very difficult few weeks. Um, and if I if I let Keely explain from her perspective, I think from a member of staff's perspective, it was that we'd all applied for that job in that position wanting to gain something from it, some gynaecological experience, which we did while it was open. And then when it got moved, there was no communication. It was just sort of, it just happened. And we were moved. Nobody knew that we'd moved there. Um, I had to nip to another ward to collect some um, medications. They didn't know we were there. If anything had have happened, it have, and we'd have had to have put a call out for an emergency it was just very it felt a little bit dangerous the first few well the first few hours we were on there because nobody had any idea we'd moved nobody knew what they were doing 
there was me and an agency nurse and it was just all very rushed and I don't think anybody stopped to think of the impact on the staff that were going to be moved thinking that they'd applied for this job upon women's health unit but that wasn't going to be what they were doing well what we were coming to work to do and what we'd applied to and that's that's it for me it was that nobody thought about how it would impact us and make us feel yeah, yeah. so i think it uh, i mean for, for me obviously um i the, the staff who who we'd, we'd appointed and who had started four of, the, of those staff members then went off sick um with mental health issues which i think was was totally avoidable um i managed and supported those staff um alongside my other staff and and trying also to, to sort of get my head around what happened um, and I spent a lot of January trying to understand and comprehend what what we'd all been through um, and then sort of thought that I needed to try and use that positively and, and the staff had met with both Sarah Ward and Tony Campbell to share their, their feelings. I met them both individually in February and that was a really, both of those meetings were really, really useful. I think I'd started to feel less emotional um, so had some really meaningful conversations um, and shared my feelings about how we need to learn from this, how perhaps going forward, you know, this this could be better. Um, I talked to Sarah about, you know, could we look at virtual ward staff? Could we recruit staff who were almost ready to to be put into those wards at the drop of a hat? So um, I know she talked about possible recruitment and, and that that was something that was being considered. Um, and I think for me with, with what's happened over the past three months with the covid pandemic i think even more importantly this year you know i, I read um i think it was one of the clinical psychologists Mark, dr laxton kane has produced some guidance for staff and managers about how this pandemic is going to affect people and she talks about um the potential reactions that we see as we hit i think the recovery phase so i think for me it's even more important than ever this year that we get this as right as we can because staff are already um, going to potentially be quite vulnerable. Um, so I, I think whatever planning is happening, um, I think it's it's really important that we, we try to get this right. Thank you very Thank you much. Very Justine and Keely, um, heartfelt um, stories there for reasons we can understand. Um, I'd like to go in the first instance to Tony. Um, uh, not least of all, as you said, you'd had the opportunity to play um, your views back to Tony and to Sarah at an earlier date. Is there anything you'd like to add, Tony? Yes, thank you, Helen. I'm, I'm coming in on Howell's uh, team's entry because mine's not working. So. Um, uh, thanks for the update, Justine. Um, as you say, uh, not an experience uh, that any of us wanted. Um, clearly, I apologise to you and the team, and I have done on several occasions and put that into writing as well. It, it didn't land the way it was meant to land. Operationally, yeah, it was a, on a day when we're going into a weekend where we had probably a sixth of the beds that we normally have going into such a weekend. Uh, there weren't the patients for the women's health unit um, and, had, and we had to operationally switch resources around and open another area. Um, what I would say, some of the communications in briefing the, the role of women's health, it was always an escalation ward and that wasn't communicated well enough to Justine and the teams and to those people who were being recruited. They certainly felt they were being recruited into a permanent uh, facility and that really wasn't the case or permanent over the course of the whole of the winter. And that was never its intention. So we've had lots of um, reflections on the on the communications from that. Um, completely agree with Justine and the team. Certainly, when I dug deep into the way the communications landed, it it did not land very well. Just those few minutes, just to explain the intense pressure the organisation was under at that moment in time, uh, would have made all the difference. And many people have reflected on that. 
What I would say to Justine and the team, and certainly with our COVID planning, those lessons, those hard lessons were applied immediately to how we went about with the COVID wards. Um, so we sought volunteers for the COVID ward, both from a leadership point of view and a team point of view. Um, we certainly gave the team freedom um, to understand how they could uh, make changes. Um, and it made it really clear the role that it played within the escalation, which was a key thing missing. So yes, for as long as we need that ward, then it'll be available. We've introduced uh, new communication methods. Uh, you'll be aware as a board that we've got strategic, tactical and operational meeting, but then the line areas have got bronze meetings, which immediately follow every daily tactical meeting and brief the exact context and position of the organization. And we back that up. Lynn put out a regular brief um, in terms of explaining how things work. And the difference this time is when we scaled down our COVID wards, i.e. closed Elizabeth, that team that came together, not worked with each other before, didn't want to be broken up. Um, they, they wanted to stay together as a team. Um, they certainly have signaled to us if we open the ward back up, can they come back together? So the complete opposite of Justine and the team's experience. Um, so every lesson that I think we could have learned uh, with the input of Justine and her team, we have applied uh, to good effect. Um, and that is how we plan to continue with our work. So I'll draw a breath there, Helen. Thank you very much, Tony. That's um, further helpful insights. Uh, can I come to you, Jane, please? Thank you, Helen. I, I just wanted to say I absolutely recognise the stress for staff and we absolutely must do our best to maintain our staff's wellbeing. But what came across to me just then was the absolute passionate of the passion of those staff and I think they should be commended for trying to maintain really high quality of care. And I think that's really, really important. So despite the fact that staff were experiencing difficulties, they've just spoken about the experience for, for women. And I think that's really, really important. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. And um, uh, would any other members of the board like to come in on this? Uh... In which Hello. case? Helen, it's Lynn Andrews, Director of Nursing and Patient Care. Um, good morning, Justine and colleagues. I, I, I want to extend my apologies to you as well, um, and I appreciate all the time you've had with those. But I, th I think your point, Justine, about the ongoing care in terms of psychological support, pastoral care for the staff beyond your experience, but also taking that through to COVID and what might be um, a staff's experience beyond that because it's not just the here and now it is the future um, and whether there's tra traumatic distress that's caused by these events we really really need to consider how we best manage that here and now for the follow-on of the recovery phase and I think that's a really valid point that you've made Justine and I know we've got within our availability services that we can access um, through various different local and national elements to that but it's about reminding the staff of those, reminding our colleagues about them and continue doing that because different people will want it at different times. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Justine and Keely, thank you very much. It's never easy to speak out, is it, when something hasn't gone um, as it should have. And it's really important um, that people do in just the way you have very um, helpfully and constructively. And it was important that these lessons came to light in any event, but particularly so in the context of um, how flexible and agile we're having to be as a trust. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're always going to have to be flexible and agile as a trust. Uh, the, the demands, of course, are that we do it in such a way that it means uh, our colleagues were able to give the best possible patient care, that our patients are safe, and also that colleagues have the um, satisfaction of uh, working in a context that they're expecting um, anticipating going into work to be in and all of those things that are so important in terms of feeling um, confident to do your job, but also feeling satisfied in terms of what the working environment's like. Um, so it's been very good of you to come and speak with us and uh, we're very grateful and we will release you onto your days. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving us the opportunity as well. Thank you. Thank you. So
So that brings us now, please, to the minutes of the board meeting held on the 29th of April. Um, they're in front of us for approval. Are we content to approve? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, we now move to the action log. Um, Jeremy has come in on the action log, but in the first instance, can I ask you, John, if you think there's anything you need to bring to our attention on the action log? Uh, no, nothing further. Okay, thank you. Jeremy? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to raise concerns about the, on page two, the corporate citizenship item being deferred again. Um, I, I think it's very long overdue that we have a proper for discussion at board level about our approach to environmental matters. And um, this was raised, I mean, uh, this dates back to November, and in fact, it predates that because it was in October that the first draft corporate citizen report came. Um, I understand completely why it was deferred from March and April, but it's now got an August date. We don't even have a board meeting in August. Uh, and it seems to me entirely unsatisfactory that it's kind of left in this way uh, without a proper date in the diary to have a, a detailed discussion about our approach to environmental matters. And I wonder whether we can't do that either next month in June or failing that in July. Uh, we will certainly make sure that happens, Jeremy. Uh, you make a very reasonable point and um, we will bring that up the uh, forward look. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that brings us then, if we may, please, to Angie's report. Um, over to you, Angie. Thanks, Helen. Um, and no surprise, again, this month, uh, a COVID focus to my report. Um, I'm going to just reiterate uh, Helen's uh, messages around um, the difficult uh, news we had to reach this month with over 100 of our patients having lost their lives. Really difficult to give a message um, regularly as we do around the loss uh, of loved ones um, and a difficult milestone uh, that uh, we sadly reached. And again, just to reiterate everyone's thanks, not only within the organisation, um, but across the system where we're doing a lot of work together, uh, whether that's with um, care homes, the hospice, um, other providers of, of healthcare, and um, to try and make sure we respond as best with, as we can as a system. So I'm going to ask Lynn just to give us um, an update on, on the overview as ever uh, my report is out of date the minute it's written. Um, and then um, Lynn will hand over to Zoe just to update on uh, the risk assessment work that we've been doing. And Zoe will then hand the baton to Tony to pick up um, and testing generally and specifically antibody testing that everyone will be aware is a, a focus at the moment. So Lynn, can I ask you to kick off for us, please? Thank you, Angie. Good morning again, everybody. Um, so um, you recall, you know, if you just cast your mind back to the end of towards the end of March was when we received our first positive case that was COVID at the time. We have set up and mean, continue to maintain our pathways of care that we have throughout the organisation where we admit patients through our emergency department who have got symptoms. We'll go um, into our wards where respiratory care predominantly is the clinical need for those patients. Um, and the, we also have a green pathway where they'll go to the predominant needs, which is their clinical priority. So those pathways have worked really well. Um, we At the, the, the peak, we had um, circa 100 patients in the organisation. And at the minute, we are down to the 30, 30-ish element, um, 27 as we speak today. And it's steadied out to about that. Um, you'll also recall our critical care. We expanded our critical care capacity to cope with the peak and the surge, as we were calling it. Um, that is now retracted back into our existing critical care units. Um, and we also have heard um, earlier that we've closed one of our COVID positive wards. Um, so that's still, um, you know, that, that was in the region of 20 beds that we were using in that ward. So you can see from all of that, that we have come off that uh, curve of the surge and are now at a reduction phase, but roughly about 20, six to 30 patients positive at any one time in the organisation. We also moved from a position of patients coming in to the organisation where we were testing those that we had suspected or symptomatic. Now we are testing every patient that is admitted to the organisation. That includes patients who are being discharged to care homes, that we're all making sure we have a test for those patients prior to their discharge. 
So, so that's a different feel we get. We get more of a prevalence feel from that as opposed to just the COVID positive patients. But that's still showing us that there are very few patients that are being admitted that are positive that we didn't know were symptomatic. So that's a really good position to be in. Our staff um, are wearing the protective personal equipment that is being provided to them. At no stage have we run out of personal protective equipment. The guidance on PP has altered over time, but that has also settled in terms of SAGE, who is the national, international group that look at um, the, the scientific guidance. And where we haven't always seen uh, clarity around the PPE, we've undertaken risk assessments within the organisation and carried that out accordingly. An example of that would be resuscitation for our patients. The Royal Colleges were saying that PPE should be worn um, entirely when you're going for a resuscitation of care, and yet the national guidance was saying you could do CPR without that for chest compression. We took the approach to make sure we had um, protective equipment on from the initiation of cardiopulmonary resuscitation and full resuscitation. So now we're moving into a situation where we want to make sure that we are able to recover and uh, restore services, but taking on board what we've always uh, been looking to do in terms of our transformation plans and that that we have put in place while actually caring for patients through the COVID period so that they're still able to see emergencies and urgent care. Um, there are certain aspects that have also challenged us with regards to swabbing, both on a national basis, the volume of swabs that we need to do and how many of our patients and staff that we can swab to get the results back to either allow them to come to work or to make sure they're safe at home, isolating and recovering from their illness. And that has been um, coordinated and supported from Tony, the Chief Operating Officer in the organisation. But also we're moving into a position now where we're looking to see whether we can test staff for, for antibodies which determine whether they have had COVID at some point in the preceding point when they have their test. And again, Tony is involved in that. But obviously for staff who we want to make sure are um, coming to work or we are caring for our staff who are either at a high or very high risk, we also have the conversations between our managers and risk assessments. So I'm going to um, just say one final thing before I hand over to, to Zoe. And that, that is about the acts of kindness. Um, we have received a phenomenal amount of support from our local community. And that is respecting us as an organisation and the work we do for them but also for our staff and the care that we deliver to our patients. And I think it's been phenomenal the amount of um, offers of kindness we've received. And there's just, uh, I know Helen, Chair, um, and Angie and others, myself, have all been involved in writing, supporting, thank you to every single one of them. But it, with, with those acts of kindness, that has really kept our staff going um, at times that have been needed. So thank you for that. And at that point, I'll to Zoe um, in the first instance and then I can pick anything up at the end after Tony's spoken if, if there's questions at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Len. Um, so I will update a little bit on the work particularly that we've been doing since the last board meeting to support our people, particularly those in more vulnerable groups or those who may have higher risk factors in relation to COVID. Um, so we've been taking a risk assessment approach. Uh, we've created an over an overarching trust wide risk assessment which is really really quite detailed and I believe has been shared with um, board members quite recently um, which describes the steps we've been taking the actions we've taken um, to mitigate risks particularly for more vulnerable groups or as I say those with higher risk factors um, at the start of May over the first bank holiday weekend um, Angie and I wrote out to all staff members highlighting the support that is available um, we talked earlier in the meeting around sort of general health and well-being um, both in the short term and the medium term and the long term and I think Lynn referenced that there is a lot of support available and we need to keep making sure that people know how to access that when they want to access that um, and we also identified particular steps we're taking to support specific staff groups so for example um, our BAME colleagues black Asian minority ethnic colleagues as an example um, to support that, our managers are having individual conversations with people in their teams and we've created quite a structured approach to, to help with those conversations. Um, so essentially to ensure that individual conversations are happening with people to understand how best we can support them. Um, and clearly looking at what's happening nationally to help us to do that too. So I, I think I will leave it there. Uh, Lynn started to talk about uh, testing. I know Tony will want to say more. Um, some of that changes 
constantly. So I will, and same way as Lynn, I think maybe pick up questions or comments at the end. So I will hand over to Tony. Thank you, Zoe. Um, so just to conclude on testing, um, so we've got a good approach on testing staff symptomatically. We're not testing asymptomatically. Um, testing of patients, as Lynn says, at the point of admission and at the point of discharge to care homes, and we're just starting to consider uh, the next set of guidance, which basically says for any patient who's been here for, as an inpatient for seven days, you should test them. So we're just sizing that up uh, to, to put that in place. And then the big one this week, which you'll hear all over the, uh, the national news, is the antibody testing. This is a test that basically says whether you have or have not uh, had COVID. Um, the clinical case is um, uh, a difficult one to make. Um, so we're gearing up this week um, to provide that level of testing for the whole of the region. We'll, we'll start probably with the, the acutes uh, and work our way around. Uh, but there's quite a challenge nationally, uh, certainly by the end of the week, to be testing at least 40,000 a day by the end of May and 122,000 a day by the end of June. So that's a massive ramp up exercise, not just for the labs, uh, because this is a, a phlebotomy blood taken exercise as well uh, to ramp up that capability to do that. So that's uh, where we are right now. And then the other point I'd make about restore and recover is uh, if a patient is coming in for a procedure, then they are uh, adopting good um, isolation techniques. So they isolate for 14 days. We test on day 14 and they come in for their procedure uh, two days later. So again, that, that, as you might imagine, will slow down the utilisation of our resources, uh, but at least keep the hospital uh, and safe from a patient and staff point of view. And I'll draw Beth at that point in the same spirit as, uh, as Zoe and Lynn. Thank you all. Is there anything else you want to say in your report, uh, Andrew? Just to note that our um, restoration recovery is item 13 on the agenda, so we'll go into more detail at, at that point, but happy for us all to pick up any questions. Thank you very much. I'd like to come to Sue in the first instance, please. You had your hand up, Sue. You're on mute. Stop it. <laughs> oh, that was a rogue hand up, was it? OK, uh, Beverly. Thank you, Helen. So we went, um, you mentioned risk assessment of, of staff. Are we actually now looking for this to be normal procedure that we we give staff health assessments and, and really support them in, in healthy lifestyles? I just unmute. Um, so at the moment, it's about the individual individual conversations. So a manager person conversation about what's important to them um, and what we can do to, to support them further. And part of that will include signposting to other areas. For example, it will be making sure they know what's available specifically to them. So as an example, for our BAME colleagues, we're currently providing vitamin D supplements as a quite specific example. Um, so it will vary person to person. I think longer term, there's the um, what does the whole occupational health offer look like once we, you know, come through and sit back and reflect, I think, and how do we, because we've changed the health and wellbeing quite, offer quite a lot as has the NHS as a whole, are both kind of locally, regionally and nationally. Um, and I'm very conscious, what do we want to sort of keep of that? Because some really great things has been happening and um, particularly around mental health, there's been a real sort of focus rightly on mental health, which I think will be a positive thing to keep in future. People are talking about that kind of thing, perhaps more now than they, they were in the past, which is, I think it's got to be quite a healthy thing. Um, so I think there's, there's a, and probably part of our restoration recovery from that point of view, what are the things that we've changed that we want to keep in some way or another into the future. Are we going to formalise it much like we do appraisal? So rather than advertise the fact that there's offerings of support, but actually make sure that we have one to ones with staff. Yes, yeah, so there is um, kind of a structured form essentially where those documents are they is documented. The conversation is documented. Yeah. Thank you, Beverly. If I may, Helen, as well on that. Thank you, Helen. I, 
a, a large part of the testing at the moment in terms of when we're looking at the um, antibody testing and swabbing to an extent is all helping to inform our understanding about the prevalence um, the research will also support some of that as well. And I think what will be key coming out of this is what lessons are we learning from that about its prevalence, about where we need to do more work, maybe on an assessment of our staff on an individual basis or those higher risk groups and how we take that forward into the future. So I, so I think what we're putting in place now is a good bedrock, but actually there may be more that might come out of the research as we come through um, in the next 18 months because it will be some time yet before we have all the information and um, which would be helpful to us as well in terms of how we approach this moving forward. Thank you, Lynn. Um, in which case, I think we'll draw that item to a close. Um, and I do think we need to note the action we've agreed there in respect of a um, new and improved approach to occupational health um, as a matter of routine on the back of the lessons we've learned uh, from uh, responding to the uh, needs of staff through the uh, COVID incident. Um, so we will uh, flesh that out in terms of what that action means more, particularly outside the meeting, but uh, we'll put it on the uh, action log so we can uh, monitor and come back to that. So thank you very much for that. Um, that then brings us to the Board Assurance Framework. Uh, this is the annual review of the Board Assurance Framework, um, so we will be asked to retire, if you like, um, all the actions that are noted and that we have taken over the last year. So it's a particularly important discussion uh, today, but if I can pass that further ado to Angie, please. Thanks, Helen. And just to note that item 15 um, is the one that Quack considered at the time around IPC assurance, um, but there's been different national updates since, so um, board need to consider that one um, further down the agenda um, and then uh, consider whether that uh, changes our, our BAF risk. Um, we've listed all the closed actions from 1920 that you'll see there, um, and our June session, we're having a strategic focus in the afternoon uh, where I want us to, to consider some of the updates that we've talked about. So, um, Jeremy, I know uh, to pick up your earlier comment, uh, some of the thinking that we've done since we wrote the strategic risk last time around corporate citizenship, how do we refresh those in, in June? And um, so the, the strategic objectives themselves stay as they are at the moment, where the specific actions that we've closed, you'll see those listed. Um, and if there's any that people have spotted that they think we need further consideration, we'll feed that those through to the committees over the next month with a view to having that overview and refresh at the June meeting. Thank you, Angie. Um, before we come to a broader discussion of this, I would like to go to the committee chairs, please, if there's anything you want to add in respect of the BAF report. Can I come to you first, Jane? Thank you, Helen. Um, I think in, in terms of 1.1, uh, 1.2 and 1.3, I think um, the actions, I'm very content with the actions that have been closed down. I think there are a number of things that uh, or, or themes that will, I'm sure, continue into next year. So um, those risks are primarily around um, patient experience, around incident reporting and also around our um, their quality of care, if you like, and their assessments externally from CQC. So I'm very content with those actions being being completed, but I think it's important to note that those will be ongoing themes for quality assurance to consider, and I'm sure they'll be reflected in the bath going forward. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Jeremy, can I come to you in the first instance in your role as the chair of People Committee, please? Uh, yes, I, I don't think I need to add anything to what's in the report about uh, the BAF risks 4, 1 to 4, 3. I think that's an accurate assessment of what we've been doing, so nothing, nothing further to add to that. I'll come back to you shortly. Um, Alison. Uh, thank you, Helen. I think for me, um, the financial structure of the NHS is shifting significantly at the moment, and at some point will shift back to different practices um, rather than historic practices. So I think we just need to think about um, being a bit more agile around the financial risks and how we articulate them 
in order to reflect that change in environment. I'm happy with the risks as they're articulated at the moment um, because that was really managing to year end. Um, but obviously moving forward, the financial structure we're currently operating on is slightly different and the consequences of um, uh, variance to control total um, there isn't even a control total is is different so I think we just need to be quite agile with the financial risks over the next uh, few months uh, to reflect our change in environment um, and um, I'm quite content with the IT stuff at the moment um, I do agree with Jeremy that we do need a refresh on our environmental strategy to help us cope with our the environmental risk that's articulated there thank you um, Mike, um, from the audit committee perspective, is there anything you want to add? No, just to echo uh, Alison's view, I think that you know the, the, the financial situation of the organisation is is quite in a state of flux at the minute, and we just need to keep an eye on that. But but other than that, the uh, the report pretty much summarises where we're at and what our issues are. Okay, thank you very much. That's a helpful update from committee chairs. Um, now. We have a number of people who'd like to make comments on the report itself. So if I can come to you first, please, Zoe. Thank you, Helen. I just wanted to clarify one of the actions described on the front page under 4.1. Um, action completed is implement AHP Bank. There is more detail in the body of the paper, but just to confirm that the decision was taken not to implement the bank after doing a full cost benefit analysis, and we decided the right decision was not to do that which is described in the main body, but just to clarify that from the front cover. Thank you. Jeremy. Um, yeah, thanks. It's a relatively minor point, maybe, but the, the actions are described as having been completed, um, but then the table describes them all as things to be done. And if this is going to be a, a definitive account of what's happened over the past year, it seems to me that it ought to be in the past tense, because otherwise somebody coming from it to it afresh might look at this and say, actually, these are all things that are going to be done in the future rather than things that have been done in the past. So although it's a tedious exercise, I appreciate, I do think it'd be better if these were described as having happened rather than things that need to happen in the future. Okay, thank you. Lynn has made a suggestion that our future document should be shorter, and I would like to give you the platform to talk to that at great length, Lynn, because I think that will be a splendid thing. Anything you want to add, Lynn? Sorry, just coming off of mute. Um, I, I just feel that we, if we want to be more cited on how our strategic objectives and the actions that we're taking, um, connect is a bit a, a bit along Jeremy's comment really is that we really need to be able to see it more at a glance um, as opposed to going through a 38 page document um, and I appreciate they didn't start out that size it's grown as the year's gone on but maybe some of the review update elements of it are, are can be more succinct um, in elements of that. Yes here here um, thank you Lynn and um, last word to Lee Well, that's very kind of you, Helen. I didn't necessarily need or want the last word, but I, I, I'm provoked to speak. Um, I, I guess just how how we map the current view of risks up to the 31st of March last year and what's going on in this year is quite difficult and complex. Mike and Alison have already identified the financial risk and environment has changed very materially. I just think doing the development thinking about what does the risk environment look like under COVID, where does that migrate to in a sort of ICS space? I, I think we probably need a bit of development time to work that through. We, we've got some very sensible objectives for the organisation that we're kind of running through and we can kind of risk assess those. I think perhaps we need to do something a bit more fundamental about the environment changing round us and, and how the risk environment is changing. I think I'm just echoing some points that have already been made and crikey if we can do that in less than 82 pages i think we'd all be thankful for that thank you lee you want to go back in Angie? yeah just to say um, uh, as warning ready for june's meeting that can we just bear all those thoughts in mind so we really do focus on updating and having some agile objectives i think when you look back on them and, and to pick up jeremy's point we maybe haven't been as succinct or 
being as focused as we needed to be when you write them. And it's always easy with hindsight, isn't it? But thinking of the environment that we in, we're in, how do we really focus our discussion in June to make sure we do that going forward? Thank Please. you. Thank you. Um, so thank you to Angie and committee chairs for that update. Um, I take from the discussion that we're content to um, note and archive the actions that have been taken with the helpful addition from Jeremy that they could be expressed in the past tense. So um, in terms of audit trail, it's clear that those actions are concluded. Um, we have further consideration of uh, infection prevention control at a later item in the agenda, but setting that to one side, uh, we're not at this point in time requiring any changes to the BAF. Uh, but we're mindful that we're on the cusp of a strategy refresh. Um, the BAF will need to um, reflect the uh, changes in the strategy, and we've expressed a shared desire that this is a much more usable and appropriate document for the board. And there's no document of 82 pages that can be appropriate for the board. Uh, we've made good progress in terms of the kind of traffic light approach and the summary um, to the high level risks. And we really need to build out from that to get something that is going to provoke and prompt the right sort of discussion around this table. So we will work on that in parallel with the strategy refresh. So thank you to everybody for that. Um, and I'm now going to move us on to the um, six monthly report in respect of freedom to speak up. Um, and in the current um, circumstances, Angie's going to give us this report rather than the freedom to speak up guardian. So Angie. Thanks, Helen. And apologies from Abby. She had already booked leave um, before she took the job on and I felt it important in um, current climate when um, it's a very challenging role and she's working clinically that she took her, her leave today. Um, so she's done the report for us and picked up the points from uh, November's report that board fed back. Uh, so she's provided more detail in relation to themes and issues, the nature of referrals um, and done a bit of work there for you on the uh, reference to size of staff groups, which was one of the discussions we had last time, um, and the divisions reflected back some of the, the national uh, work and thinking. Um, and a request from Abby that I think it was in, in the changeover, we've slightly moved uh, the six monthly report out of alignment with the National Guardian's office. Um, so a request that she bring her next report back in October and we move back to October and April rather than May and November. Um, and that facilitates us uh, refreshing and updating the self-assessment that was started in December um, and unfortunately for various reasons didn't get completed with board. So I know Helen circulated some further information for board to uh, set that context, uh, but it would be good to have a bit more um, feedback and time to feed into uh, to the assessment that Abby started. Um, and I know Beverly, uh, you talk and meet with Abby um, and myself and Lynn and Zoe regularly. So if there's anything you want to add to the report before we open up for questions, uh, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Angie. Um, just to highlight, really, I think the report shows that um, Abby's making great efforts to reach out across the organisation. Um, there's no national guidance on um, Freedom to Speak Up champions. We currently have 14. But actually, I spoke to Abby yesterday and she put a Facebook post out and had three more volunteers. So she is um, networking with, with other guardians to see if there's any good practice that she can learn from. And certainly analysing where we might want to seek to, um, to encourage more champions across the organisation. Just, just one point, actually, Angie. She, she did say to me that she's allocated 18 hours in her guardian role. And this year she's spending pretty much the whole of her time in meetings and discussions with staff coming forward. So I think at some stage we might have to consider the resourcing, whether whether 18 hours is sufficient or indeed whether we need, I know some trusts do have assistant guardians. So it's something we might want to keep on the radar. Thanks, Beverly, and that, that's a good point. I think that's counting her formal time as well, when actually, even when she's on shift, she, she um, takes up that role. 
So I think I've certainly worked in organisations where they've been almost um, full time and one where it was full time role. So maybe something we could consider as a, a board um, to keep an eye on, as you say. But there is Thanks. just one more comment I wanted to make, actually, just to assure the board in every case, um, Abby gets excellent support from from the exec team and from from management. So when there is an issue, there's no hesitation at all for the for the execs to step forward and, and support her. Thank you, Beverly. Um, Jeremy. Need Thank you. Yes, just a couple of quick questions. Um, firstly, just for the avoidance of doubt, there's reference in the paper to, um, for example, on page five, section three, Abby receiving support, monthly meetings with myself. And I'm just not entirely clear who's written this paper. Is that Does that mean you, Angie? Yes, it does. OK, thanks. And then on page 11, in the case report, the case study towards the bottom of page 11, um, the last paragraph starts, this proves to be a challenging case for Abby and she feels it may have had a negative impact on speaking up culture in the area, despite being positively promoted. And I wonder why, why she felt that. Do you, do you have any insight into that? Because it seems yes. to me it was you know, appropriately raised and properly dealt with, so why would it have a negative impact on speaking up culture? Yeah, there, were, there was a specific point that I know Lynn, Zoe, Beverly may, may want to come in on this discussion as well. We, we um, supported Abby through this one. Um, it was the way she shared the information with her line manager um, that, that had an impact that may be perceived by some of the team um, to Abby to, how do I put it, Abby not to have appropriately shared the information. Um, I don't think it was, and I think Abby gave herself quite a hard time on it, but it was it was part of her learning. Um, and, and I say colleagues have talked through with Abby, I know a lot on that. Um, and actually things have developed and progressed both in her relationship with the manager in that area um, and with the, the team in a more positive way. So um, I think she was quite, she's been quite harsh on herself, but it was an important learning point for her and, and for all of us. OK, thank you. OK, can I come to Sue, please? Thank you, Helen. Yes, I seem to have managed to come off mute as well. Um, I think it's a great report. Thank you. And I'm really pleased to see the volume of cases going up. I just wanted to ask um, for a bit more insight on the um, on page six. We referenced the fact that the more anonymous cases now being raised um, from November than in the previous time period. And, and obviously you already say it's important that people feel able to safe enough to speak up. Um, what's the thinking on how we kind of move it from anonymous to not anonymous? Is that an, is that an, an ambition that we have? And what's Abby's role in making that happen? Yeah, that's certainly an, an ambition. And, and Abby and I um, talk regularly about um, success would be that her and I are both out of our jobs, because actually, <laughs> if everybody feels comfortable to talk to their line manager or to a colleague, then um, we don't need any of us or, or Abby. So that, that's certainly an ambition. Um, and my comment is always in the world that we live in, I'd love that to be the case right now, but we're also recognising that for various reasons, sometimes people don't feel comfortable to talk to their boss or, or um, you know, an, an immediate colleague. Um, so it's giving that avenue to make sure we can still hear, um, but, Yes, how do we continue to do that? So I think the example Beverly gave around Abby using um, uh, Facebook, how she gets out and about, how we all reiterate that message that it's OK to speak up. The example Helen reiterating earlier to Justine that, you know, that was really important that they did. Um, and one, I think I, I caught myself having a word with myself um, last week because I think we perceive and they tend to be um, ones that are a bit more negative. So people feel they have to speak to Abby because they can't raise it safely in their own environment. Where actually we had an example last week where someone wanted to share some really good experience around COVID. Um, and I thought, well, why did they not go to their manager or, or talk to you know, any of us, but they went chose to go to Abby. Um, but actually, again, she handled that really well. That person is now meeting with um, various colleagues to talk about the really good things that she wants to make sure we keep. So I, I think it's important to say, yes, we, we want that message that no one feels that they have to do it anonymously. 
um, but also recognise that for whatever reason, sometimes people don't have that confidence, whether it's a positive or negative, um, to raise their, their voice. And that will probably take us a while um, in an NHS culture to shift. Thanks, Andrea. Zoe. So just to build on that, really, I agree with everything Angie said there. I would also say that we know the more that we have people speaking up, whether that's anonymous or not, or for something negative or sometimes just to something positive, the more confident people get in that and they have the personal experience and think actually that that was OK, you know, and um, we read some of the feedback that Abby herself is given, which is really, really positive. Uh, and the more that the more that, that happens, the more people have the personal experience and they talk to other people as well. So it's all about in encouraging more of it, which I think will then help with the more people feeling like they can say this, I'm so and I want to say this rather than doing it through an anonym, anonymous route. Thank you. Yeah, Lynn. Thank you. Uh, I was partly going to see what um, Zoe has just mentioned, but one of the things I feel um, Abby coming into the role, she's been there for a while now, what we see is Abby's connection uh, with the executive is very productive as well in that she gets immediate response from her. that in itself goes back to the individual who's raised concerns with her very quickly she's a very proactive active in that sense and that's creating this ability for staff to think we're getting feedback immediately and therefore it, that helps with this raising concerns and getting the message out to others to say look when we do do this we get a good response we get it quickly and that helps them move on in that situation as well i, I also want to add the part about certainly some of the things that i've been discussing with abby staff feel sometimes it's still difficult to talk, talk to managers because they still feel they, they want to continue working there they want to get on with what's going on and they don't always have all the answers themselves so, so and how and maybe not describe this as well as i can do or they, if they've raised something and therefore don't want to say something in case it's not quite right and that's why talking to abby gives them that sense of, yeah, you have got this right or it's pitched right before they maybe go and do that. And certainly one case particularly that I've dealt with Abby, that's allowed the individual to then give herself some more headroom to get her head around it before she went to her manager, which I know she has subsequently done. So I think there's something about allowing that still to happen um, as, as, as opposed to as making everybody's got the manager. Sometimes that isn't the right thing to do for the individual. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's been a good discussion. Um, I think our thanks uh, must go to Abby. She's clearly doing a splendid job for us. And um, as has been noted, very encouraging that uh, we're seeing more and more people uh, coming forward to speak up. And uh, in that context and the amount of time and resource commitment Abby's giving, we've agreed that we will review whether the amount of resource at 18 hours a week is um, adequate uh, for the uh, role. Um, we also talked about the fact that the paper notes that the self-assessment tool was concluded by our executive colleagues, but of course the requirement is that it's concluded as a board exercise. So uh, we've taken an action to make sure that happens. And at the same time, we will bring the reporting um, in terms of freedom to speak up uh, back to board on the cycle that coincides with the national, uh, the Office of the National Guardian uh, reporting cycle. So we'll have it back again in October. Um, I anticipate the board level self-assessment included in that report. So um, thank you to Abby, thank you to Beverly, and thank you to Angie for the report. So we'll move on now to the um, patient and staff experience report. Um, this uh, was the uh, artist formerly known as um, the um, staff experience report, but as we've requested, we're bringing um, metrics, not only in terms of staff um, engagement, alignment and satisfaction uh, to bear in terms of examining where it is we need to give extra help or support, but we're helpfully extending that to look at patient satisfaction parameters too. So this is the first report to the board in that format. Um, so we're very grateful that that's come to us in the way it has. And I don't know whether uh, Zoe or Lynn is leading off. Shall I start, Lynn? 
I'll take, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> um, so thank you, Helen. As you say, we agreed that we would combine the ex exec sponsor role for both staff and patient experience. The paper describes the process that we've gone through to identify the, um, the 10 teams this time around using a combination of metrics, quite a range of different kinds of metrics, as well as some soft intelligence too. We agreed this a few weeks ago now as an exec team um, and the paper describes what the execs have each been starting to do in terms of making contact with the teams. Um, there are some which are continued teams and those, there are some new teams as well. So it's a bit of a bit of a mixed picture in there. I, I don't know if you want us to talk about that anymore in terms of our personal connections with the teams, Helen. Or anything else you want to add, Lynn? Just wait till I check if anything um, Lynn wants to add before we um, we get a bit of a flavour of what's happening with teams. Thank you, Zoe. So the only thing that I would add, which I was going to bring out as well in the patient experience report, was about the fact that um, certainly teams, as we look at it from a patient experience perspective, at the minute there we don't have the same level of intelligence that we would normally get from our patients given in the COVID position and the access to certain things that we would use to get their feedback. So there may be some issues that we're not quite cited on as a result of that for when we look at patient experience from an exec perspective. Um, and also the teams have come together. So if I take one of the wards that I'm certainly looking at, the, the, the team that that matron is looking after now isn't the team that she was looking after when the staff survey was done. So we've just got to be mindful of taking that on board when we're looking at this at the moment. Thank you. Um, so a flavour, I think, Zoe, as you've suggested, um, will be really helpful. OK, so I'll start, then I'll hand around to colleagues. So my two teams are continued teams. So I've been the exec sponsor in different guises previously, which means that I've been in contact with the teams throughout the, the kind of COVID pandemic rather than just in the last month or so. Um, so if I talk about Murphy, first of all, so visited the team on different occasions and really talked to the matron there and team members about their, their changing experience and how they moved from being the ward that they were, sort of surgical ward, looking after different specialties to currently one of our more COVID wards um, and the impact that's, that's had on the team. And they, they very much talked about how they've really pulled together um, and some you know, great examples which we've seen throughout really in this whole experience of how people really pull together you know when 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 times are tough um and that's definitely been happening and real rapid change and that's a team where the matron's relatively new to the team so to, to lynn's point really um hasn't been there throughout the whole period of when the metrics were gathered um my other team is eastwood stroke units um so speaking to them recently they're obviously very happy about the decision that was made at board last month um to support the the hazoo and that the, the when I saw them a couple of weeks ago working towards opening some of the hypercute beds, which is going going to plan. Um, so that's had a really positive impact on them. Um, and we've also talked about how kind of COVID has had an, an impact on people presenting or not to the hospital for other reasons, which I know we've discussed as a board. So and particularly in relation to stroke, um, some of the concerns nationally around whether people are presenting early enough with those with those kind of um, symptoms or not. So, but yes, yeah, certainly my last conversation was a positive one in light of the um, the board decision. So there was a thank you from them. Very good, thank you, Zoe. Um, would other executive colleagues like to tell us uh, what you've managed to achieve so far with your new or continuing teams? So I I can come in now. It's Tony. So I'll can my areas are ED, which is a continuation from last time, and EMU, the assessment area. Um, so I had a really good hour with the divisional triumvirate and the acute um, care group triumvirate as well. Uh, we had a really good discussion about their freedom uh, to develop ideas in support of COVID. You'll all be aware of how we've modernised and created a green area for ED within the fracture clinic area. And that's worked really well, led clinically, well, multidisciplinary as a team, and they're learning all the time. Uh, brilliant exercise uh, as preparation for the development of the, uh, the department with the funding that we've got. Um, we had a lot of time to share uh, thoughts around their experiences at the minute because they put in very different working patterns to, to cope and support each other with management of COVID. 
Um, so that's very good. They haven't lost the opportunity to continue working on aspects of the multidisciplinary team. Um, there's nothing like a good event like COVID to bring a team together, and that's certainly working within ED and EMU. Um, they've got some good uh, news stories in terms of recruitment around their consultants and the leadership, so, so uh, that's going well. Um, their patient experience scores were, have been up during this period. Um, so again, um, members of the public very, very complimentary of how they're handling the situation from a COVID point of view. Um, and we talked about, I see them most days anyway from an operational point of view, um, but they're still working on some of the team development um, that was part of their uh, longer term sort of team development plans. They haven't lost doing that. So really very positive. Um, they, I took the opportunity to explain the role uh, that I have and sought their opinion on how they would like me to support them. Um, but very positive in a really good place. Um, so I'll stop there. And as I'm sharing Hal's phone, I'll let Hal come in now, if that's OK. Hi there. I'm, I'm not sure if I should disinfect the phone at this point because it's been, it's been oh my the colleague. So, um, so I, I'm, um, I've got one new area, um, which is outpatients. Um, I've had preliminary meetings with them and, and uh, sort of contacting them to see how um, they want me to help in this kind of COVID period. They're obviously an area which has been um, massively affected in changed working practices because of coronavirus, because of the shifts from um, face to face to virtual meetings. So, but um, I'm uh, meeting with them in order to see how we can try and help and improve things. Um, my other area is a continuation area, which is theatres. Um, again, obviously very, very changed by the current coronavirus situation. Um, I think it's worth, from my perspective, I, I've noted that the um, feedback about theatres and, the, and the, the, the sort of negative feedback, which is why it's an exec sponsor area, is very much focused around PACU. Whereas over the course of the last year, the rest of theatres, I think, has come on an awful lot from the point of view of um, under the, the guidance of um, Claire Gill, the theatre matron, and, and Kevin, divisional director in surgery, that I think they have really made quite a bit of progress in theatres proper, but there's still um, some some blocks of granite in, in um, Paku, I think it's fair to say. Um, the only other thing I would mention is that um, Markham was previously one of my areas, but I'm, I'm pleased to say that as a result of improved staff feedback, um, things are um, that they're no longer one of the exec priority areas. Um, and I think that's I would reflect that that's been quite evident in my um, working with them over the last year, that I think they are in a different place. Um, and actually, the coronavirus crisis has really brought out the best in, in them because they've been sort of very much in the front line as a respiratory ward. But they've they've really uh, worked well together as a team and I think feel much as a team feel much more coherent than they did before. Um, so I'm doing a farewell lunch with them next week, but otherwise I'll be um, keeping in touch, obviously, but, but waving goodbye to them as an exec priority area. Um, thank you very much. Uh, did you want to talk about Durant, Lee? Yes, so I, I keep hold of decontamination unit to make sure there's some sensible continuity there about what happens next with the unit. So we're, we're firming up those plans. Um, I've met with the matron on Durant um, sort of frailty unit, which is quite an interesting area in the context of an area of the trust that's been strongly impacted by COVID and quite an open and broad question about what precisely does restoration look like for sort of frailty and comprehensive geriatric assessment. And we had quite an interesting chat about how I can best discharge my responsibilities as an exec sponsor, where perhaps the clinical model there might look quite different over the next six months or so in terms of how we reach out with that model. And I think it's probably quite an interesting, interesting area of the trust about that some of the discombobulation for staff when, when in actual fact their clinical workload's been strongly impacted on and that they're not seeing as many folk and what 
the alternate model of care might look like through the COVID period. So it was an interesting conversation and the matron there is firming up how, how she thinks I best assist in there. So I think it, it was a productive conversation and, and I have yet to meet our RPC Ashgate colleagues, but I think that'll be very timely just to do a little bit of a litmus test on the pressure and changes in primary care at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, Beverly. Thank you, Helen. Um, it's perhaps stating the obvious, but particularly in the light of the previous paper, if I could just urge the exec team when they're out on their walkabouts to promote Abby and our freedom to speak at Guardian. So we, we can't spread the message enough. So it's just take every opportunity. Thanks, Beverly. Um, if we conclude it, um, I think in summary, I would say this is a really important initiative. Um, I think the huge improvement we've seen in staff satisfaction and alignment, and that has borne fruit not only in um, our internal surveys, but in the last staff survey, is in no small part due to the visible leadership shown by our executive colleagues, and um, in so doing, the importance we as a board attach to all of this. Um, so thank you for everything you've done. Um, I know it's uh, taken a lot of shoe leather, uh, but if we're not here for that, I mean, what are we here for? So thank you. Um, also thanks to Lynn and Zoe for working together in the way they have, because of course, um, it's it, there's a you know there's a, not really a cigarette paper between staff satisfaction and patient satisfaction. Happy happy staff will mean happy patients, and uh, you know it all becomes a virtuous circle. So the fact that we're looking at it through this lens, I think, is uh, to be applauded. It was lovely to have um, little anecdotes and snippets, uh, vignettes of what's been happening out and about. Um, particular congratulations to Hal, that Markham is off the list, so to speak. And nice to note that you're, um, you know, marking that and that passage um, and almost a battle pass in that visible leadership now being sustained by the team locally. And I think that's a really uh, sensible and, and important thing to do. And also good listening to um, Tony's uh, reports of A&D, um, uh, and not least of all in the context of some of the external validation we've had recently about the um, splendid uh, progress we've made on the Civility Saves Lives initiative. Um, having said that, I'm sure we'll be returning to A&E in the context of the Integrated Performance Report shortly. Um, but not wishing to conflate those two things now. Uh, very encouraging progress across the board. And uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to have this on the agenda, um, including the uh, feedback from what you'll be finding out about, um, not least of all as an indication of the importance we attach to all of this. So thank you. Um, if I can move us across the page now, please, to item 10. Um, and item 10 is the independent review of the serious investigation into the care of Callum Hubbard during 2014. Um, so if we can come to you, please, Lynn. Thank you, Helen. Um, this is a second paper that's come to board with regard to We can't hear you, Lynn. And then subsequently, the review that was undertaken independently, and um, further to that, uh, the actions from that independent review and ombudsman's review of the complaints as well. What you can see from the paper is that we have completed all the actions with regards to the parliamentary service ombudsman's recommendations, and we have completed all the actions in practice with regards to the independent review. But as yet not completed them so they've been implemented but we haven't yet followed that through with um revise of the policy which is in hand um, as a result of the patient safety incident framework that is uh, being revised and we were a pilot site that's been put on hold because of covid so we haven't allowed that to stop us from taking the actions forward but it just means that our policy doesn't reflect yet what we might do moving forward and um, but nonetheless we've got it in practice so wanted this paper today to provide assurance to the board that we've taken all those actions and that we can now write back to the parliamentary service ombudsman to say that that is the case um, with the board's uh, approval to do so. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, and just to add that Lynn and I met with um, family members 
early March, I think just before COVID, um, and their acceptance of where we've got to, and their request at an appropriate point in time that we think about how we remember Callum. Uh, we did assure them that we, we refer to Callum by name in our discussions, um, but they wanted to think of something along the lines of how um, Kate Granger is remembered through Hello My Name Is. Uh, so I just wanted board to be aware that that was uh, the discussion we had with the family at that point in time. Thank you, Angie. Um, so the ask in front of you today is that um, on the basis of the assurance Lynn has given us about the PHSO actions being completed and the practical um, steps that will be taken on the back of the recommendations of the independent review with the policy changes in train and to follow that we would write back to the Parliamentary and Health Services Ombudsman to confirm a completion. Um, is the board content? It's agreed, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so we have two actions then. We will write back to the Parliamentary and Health Services Ombudsman and we will have a report at a future date board to consider how it is we might um, reflect on and action um, the very um, uh, understandable and I think to be welcomed recommendation of the Hubbard family uh, that we find a way that we remember Callum and ensure that patients going forward can benefit from the lessons we've learned on the back of his uh, sad demise. So if I can move us on now please to item 11. Item 11 is the quarterly quality report um, and Lynn you're on again. Thank you very much. Um, I am a, yeah I am a speaker yes I was just checking. Um, so thank you again just to note that a more detailed report from the quality uh, goes to the Quality Assurance Committee. This is um, a summarised version um, to give adequate information to board for their assurance uh, and Jane may also wish to comment um, further moving forward. Um, I, I think just uh, the report is there for your information, you can ask any questions that, that you wish, but just to note that we're providing the board with assurance that we have got good systems and processes in place. Um, but I draw that particularly to your attention because, as I previously said, with regards to patient experience, as a result of COVID, we were instructed to take and remove um, items that we collect patient experience data on, um, things like uh, the screens, the, pot, the, um, the methods where there's touch processes going on, um, cards being turned, returned in the post. So our information moving forward currently is going to be limited from probably about a quarter at least. Uh, nonetheless, our patient experience feedback is still very good um, in terms of inpatients, uh, day case, um, maternity services and achieving um, the levels that we wish to. Patient safety as well, we have good assurances there. Um, you may note in the IPR, it looks like our response to incidents has altered. Again, it's a one month period. We wouldn't necessarily look into that particular detail at this point in time but clearly to ensure that there, there are no significant or moderate harms that we're not looking at it's more the low and no harm which they need to close off on the system um, and in terms of our clinical effectiveness as well how we want to comment but uh, our audit program has slowed as a result but we still are continuing with elements of that through our clinical effectiveness meeting so I'm happy to take questions um, from the board with regards to the detail of the paper. Um, can I come to you in the first instance Jane if there's anything you want to add? Um, just to say that we ran a full quality assurance committee with, with which we received this report on the 11th of May, uh, a more in-depth uh, version of this report, I might add. And actually what we really noted was all of the national directives about what needed to cease temporarily and what didn't. That said, we had a very large amount of information presented to us for which we were very grateful. Um, we noted that we would have some um, soft intelligence to support our patient experience 
in terms of um, friends and family tests being suspended. So there are some other mechanisms that we can use that are informing our understanding of the quality of care. So, uh, again, the, the committee were really pleased to hear that. Again, around the incident um, uh, framework, we're, we're really pleased to be part of that um, pilot and obviously hoping that that will get established again in September, because that's really important to us. Uh, in the way that we're going to be investigating serious incidents and the way that we'll have different freedoms to look at different factors and investigate and respond in different ways. Um, so that in terms of the last item, in terms of Callum Hubbard, I think that's also really important to know that we haven't lost sight of that and we expect that to move forward. Um, in terms of clinical effectiveness, again, you've noted that some of the national audits are paused. But again, we did have a, quite an in-depth conversation about um, how we are going to restore services and how we'll know about the outcomes of patients in terms of restoring not just cancer services, but a, a wider gamut of, of services per se. So I think um, Quality Assurance Committee, we ran our normal meeting. Um, we've minimally deferred things. And what's presented to you today in the quality report is, is a brief, uh, quite a brief extract, uh, in, in fact, of what, of what we, uh, we discussed. Thank you both for that um, assurance. Um, now, colleagues, who would like to come in? OK, I think it's testament to the quality of the report. I am um, corresponded with Lynn and Jane on the back of uh, this report, and I received uh, possibly one of the finest emails ever by return. Uh, providing even more assurance. Um, and I thought it was really splendid, Lynn, the way you were able to give a kind of um, COVID and CQC lens over and across the quality report and without wishing to put further work on you on the back of what is already a, an excellent I'm leaving. report. Um, <laughs> you might be kind enough to just share the uh, key elements of that exchange we've had with colleagues, because I'm sure they too would take... Um, um, even uh, further comfort from it. Um, so uh, if you'd be kind enough to do that. So um, on that note, I think we will note uh, the assurance that's provided on the back of the uh, quarterly quality report. So thank you very much for that. I'll send um, email properly. Oh, very good. Thank you. As we speak. Um, so that brings us to the uh, finance update. Um, and the financial arrangements for COVID-19 as we go forward into 2021. Um, Lee, please. Thank you, Helen. Um, three things to update on, and I'll do all three then pause. Um, year end, month one, and where we're at in terms of Derbyshire capital and what's going on in terms of capital funding. So year end to confirm, we still have KPMG completing the statutory audit, so I can't say definitively what the position is until that's completed. But where we've got to is a deficit from control total purposes in financial year 1920 of 1.7 million, which broadly we can account for associated with the income reduction that we saw in March when we were cancelling elective surgery, less patients in outpatients, less patients in ED. So the commitment we made at Q3 about getting to break even, we didn't quite get to that number, but I think we've got a strong narrative as to why we didn't manage it. We've closed that gap through some non-recurrent technical items, not least the fact that we had a deferred tax asset that gave us a £2.7 million benefit to get us to that £1.7 that got us that £1.7 million deficit number. Full stop. Then in terms of the statutory accounts, when we've done our property valuation, we have a reversal of impairment. The property values have gone up and 2.8 million of that change has been charged back to INE that will get us to a statutory account surplus of 1.5 million. So there's a little bit of a pre-control total number of a deficit of 1.7 million, which I think we can explain. And then there's a reversal of impairment in the statutory accounts that gets us to a statutory account surplus. So hopefully, Helen, that, that explains the dissonance between those two numbers in terms of what it says in the face of the statutory accounts and what we're compliant with in terms of the control total values for NHSI. So we've just got to work through the statutory accounts process 
and hopefully that will all land. I will deal with, in the first instance, accounting officer, chair of audit and chair of finance committee if anything moves through the audit process, but it's gone a bit quiet in terms of property valuations, so no news is good news in terms of the numbers not moving further. But none of the numbers movement will hit on anything other than the statutory accounts position. They shouldn't affect and won't affect the control total position. So I think that's the old year, hopefully largely done and dusted. Obviously, the external audit and valuation process is made a bit tough by people not being able to attend site and other things which we are dealing with. Um, in terms of month one, then, we're, we're breaking even under the COVID funding arrangements. So completely different way we're being funded, block funding, top up funding. And, and you can see that quite starkly in Appendix 3 of the report. In, in Appendix 3 of the report, where previously there was a dense cops of numbers in income, down to care unit and divisional level, that doesn't exist for this year because none of our reimbursement is based on the number of patients we are treating. So there's quite a stark illustrative example there of quite how much the funding environment has changed and the fact that we've got a, a, a block funding arrangement irrespective of the number of patients we treat. It's now been confirmed that that block funding arrangement is extended until the end of October. Previously, we were anticipating it will be April, May, June and July. It was confirmed on a national docs webinar about a fortnight ago. That will now that block funding arrangement will be in place till the end of October. To be honest, then my reading of that is I think that block funding arrangement will be in place for the rest of the financial year not least because we've only then got five five months left of the financial year. So I think that block funding arrangement is both a risk and an opportunity. It, it's an opportunity in as much as um, if we change the way we deliver care, more advice and guidance, more virtual outpatients, the funding won't go down based on what we were previously funding. Obviously, when we get into restoration and we're treating more patients in the hospital than we are doing today, we just need to be aware of the marginal costs of that treatment and be able to monitor it. So I think that'll do for month one. Um, the, the latest issue that we're dealing with is a capital allocation that's been given for all the statutory organisations in Derbyshire, including ourselves, UHDB, the Community Trust, DHFT and EMAS, where we've been asked to get to an overall capital programme for Derbyshire a capital envelope of 46.7 million. Um, we thought that might be quite stretching at a point in time, not because, not least because UHDB's capital programme on its own was 52 million at a point in time. So obviously if all the capital went to UHDB, that would present a problem for other stakeholders. I've been speaking to NHSI this morning and we think what we've managed to do is get down to an overall capital programme across the system of 10 million pounds greater than that 46.7 million which should be acceptable we think in the eyes of NHSI so as an example what we've done at Chesterfield is we've looked at what did we plan to spend and to a large extent what will we be physically able to spend for the rest of the year in terms of medical equipment particularly estates work and access to contractors and a revised view of when we'll probably be able to do the urgent care village which isn't at the same pace as we previously thought so included in appendix two in the paper is a bit of an audit trail from this is what we assumed we we wanted to spend as an organization pre-covid there's then this was our do minimum capital program which we've previously talked about in board then some further refinement which gets us down to a capital ask against the capital envelope for chesterfield royal of 5.1 million, which has largely been derived from this is what we think we'll be able to spend. So I think year end, we broadly got there through some technical items. Month one, we're breaking even under the new funding regime. There's this late breaking news about non-COVID capital, non-STP capital, about getting down to this capital envelope, which we've managed to do between us across the organisations in Derbyshire with a little bit of leeway that I was negotiating before the board meeting this morning with NHSI. 
Thank you very much, Lee. That's a clear uh, and a helpful um, reminder of where we're at. Um, I've got a few people wanting to come in, but I'd like to go to Alison in the first instance, please. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, I'm not sure if this is a Lee and Angie or a Tony question. It's probably all three. Um, I'm interested in some commentary about the balance of the cost base as we move away from COVID response and into restoration phase. So what I'm understanding from what you've said, Lee, is that our revenue level um, isn't variable. It's a consistent month nine as per last year, const constant revenue level, da, da, da. Um, and therefore, it's about watching the cost base as we move from uh, COVID activity into further activity. Have we got um, any forecasts that would give the board assurance that we can live within our envelope? Do, do you want me to take that, Helen, in the first? I think that's an important one to take now. Thank you, Lee. I think the very honest answer, Alison, is not yet. So, so the work that we've been doing, which are looking at the costs that we occurred in 1920 and how we link those to activity. Some of those costs we know we've already shared in particular areas around locum and agency spend. I think what we need to do next is go our predictive model of what the cost base should be under COVID looks like this. And when we start to do the restoration work, we can start to add into additional costs for that forecast. I think we need a couple of months to do that. So after month two, we should be able to start looking at are we going to have a problem against the block funding arrangement or not? But in the national finance team for NHS e and i they've started to concede if we materially start to ramp up elective programme and other things, yeah. the block funding arrangement won't work, but we haven't got the details of how that will flex yet. Thank you, Lee. Um, Atoll, please. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, Lee, yes. Yeah, uh, just trying to understand Appendix 2 a little bit more. Um, we've, we've, we've got items such as urgent must do and things required for compliance, which go down quite substantially as a result of the process you, you outlined. So really, are, are we saying that we didn't start off with things which were urgent must do or required for compliance? Or are we with our eyes open, ignoring things that we have to do to comply with something or the other simply because of the cost pressure? A bit of both at all is the, is the quick answer. So there's probably things on reappraisal where we've gone, is it absolutely urgent and must do, thing one. The second category is more of, will we physically be able to access the site and do some of these things at the moment in terms of access to contractors and other things? So th there's a bit of both. There's a bit of reappraisal of what was urgent and must do which derived the original view of the 19.9 million, and then a reappraisal which has got us to the 9.4 million, which is, well, there's some things that probably weren't as urgent as we were first classifying, and the fact that we probably won't be able to do elements of them. So I don't think we're squeezing anything out that we need to be unduly concerned about in terms of statutory compliance or other issues. Yeah, I, th I think that it would be useful somewhere in our structure to, to uh, note that uh, whether it's uh, at a subcommittee or somewhere else, that there are, we are not letting go of things that we have to comply comply with that are required statutorily. Second question is, uh, in terms of uh, how the programme is financed, you've got a line for cash, um, for cash funded. Uh, what What is that cash? Is that our reserves? Is that the allocation from um, uh, NHS, uh, EI or what? So, the, the cash funded items, the things that we're funding as a trust itself. So the, the, the envelope that's been set for Derbyshire excludes things like urgent care village and the IT funding, which are funded by a national source. So the other things on there in total, which value are valued at 5.1 million are funded by our own cash. In actual fact, our planned depreciation for this year is around 6.5 million. So there isn't a call on our own cash this year because of the interaction between the cash that's generated from depreciation. We've got a funding source and a bit spare in actual fact, which is why it's negative 1.4 million at the bottom of that last column, Athel. Okay, thank you. 
Um, thanks, Ashel. Uh, Keith, please. Hi, Lee. I think your part of your last conversation with Atoll may have slightly answered it because I was going to ask if the urgent care village funding is separated from that 47 million of Derbyshire, which I think you answered. My second point is, how do we make sure while playing very well in the system and playing that that, that, that fund of money doesn't get um, watered away, if you like, particularly if we're starting later and finishing later because of the current environment we're all in now, how do we make sure that we can ring fence that sum of money so we don't get a third of the way through the project and then not have what we thought we needed to complete it because it's kind of slightly watered away into a wider system somewhere? We've been absolutely given assurances from NHSI and, and actually because it was in an autumn statement that the funding is available for both urgent care village and the health service led investment fund for IT. So we, we'd have to go some way for somebody in NHSI or the Department of Health to say you can't have that money anymore. Statement one. So we have been given those assurances. Um, th there's obviously a, quite a difficult piece of work going on at the moment to arbitrate between different statutory organisations and this notion of a Derbyshire capital envelope. The reason why I've been pushing the envelope a little bit further to get us an extra 10 million is because really if we started to get into a squabble between different statutory organisations about how we could tell capital programmes, NHSI themselves concede they haven't really got the mandate to do some of that. So I think what each organisation has done is get to a this is what we need to spend and what we think we're going to spend, which hopefully based on my conversation this morning was an acceptable number from an NHSI point of view. If we got into NHSI saying, you've got to take a further 10 million out from the number that we've got to between statutory organisations, it would be fascinating then how the governance would that would run because they're governing each individual organisation, despite the fact that we've been given this envelope for the system. So we're safe on Urgent Care Village and HSLI, but obviously what happens into the future and what the capital regime is, say, for 21-22, and does that come into the system, things need to look very different than the FT model we've got at the moment. I feel partially assured, Lee. <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't assure you further, given the absence of guidance on a national level. No, I, I appreciate that. I thank you for your response, Lee. I, pre I appreciate what you say. Thank you. On that note, I wonder if the action flowing from this discussion is possibly twofold. Um, despite the fact that the 1.7 million deficit at year end against the control total is explainable in the context of COVID, um, I think we know from the reports we've had to board previously from the Finance and Performance Committee that that figure did move around um, perhaps a little bit more fluidly than we would have been comfortable with in um, ideal circumstances. So I, I would suggest that we have a light touch, but nevertheless penetrating lessons learned on the um, 1920 outcome. Um, I'm not sure it's a board item, but it certainly might be an item to, to inform our strategy refresh um, sessions that we have lined up, because there's something about that uh, financial planning and certainty that will be important in the strategy uh, piece. So I would suggest we take that action from this discussion. And um, I think with regard to 2021, as the exchange has just played out between Lee and Alison, it will be sensible if we could ask um, Finance and Performance Committee, please, to look at the risks and issues um, associated with block funding arrangements. Um, perfectly understand the immediate response that it's going to take a while to see how this shakes out. But I think the more work we can be doing to anticipate that, um, the better. And of course, lovely again to have the um, uh, assurance around the money secured for the urgent care village in the context of the um, of the capital update. So uh, well done and thank you on that too. So I think with that we'll um, conclude the, um, the the finance um, update.
and move to item 13, if we may please, um, which is the uh, COVID-19 restoration and recovery um, item. Tony. Thank you, Helen. Um, hopefully the paper is fairly uh, self-explanatory, but I'll just cover some broad issues for you. Um, the little balancing act that we're doing uh, at the minute is one coping with our current COVID um, response, um, staying alert and aware um, for the potential of a second wave as a result of some of the relaxation of social distancing. Um, and clearly, as the paper outlines, our focus on restore and recover our essential services. And we were certainly given a, a bit of a six week challenge uh, by Simon Stevens and Co on that. And then I have to admit, I've got one, one eye afar into winter as well. Um, so all of this is uh, the balancing act. The considerations we have to take as we start to ramp up uh, or add additional services back, back online is both our testing and PPE supply chains are based on uh, push principle and based on your previous usage. So we cannot expand it too fast because we will burn them uh, use them too quick and compromise ourselves. Uh, paramount uh, in some of our approach around COVID has been to, to try and not make uh, some of our environments of COVID and, and uh, ED, et cetera, intense. So we've deliberately operated at a low occupancy, uh, which allows our staff to provide really good care uh, and good experience for our patients, but also allows them to look after themselves as well. And whatever we bring up back online, we've got to be very, very cognizant of uh, the infection control uh, sort of considerations and, and social distancing. So life is really not uh, the same at all. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the board, um, the lessons from winter we have applied um, both in our approach to management of COVID, but also um, our approach to just managing the hospital and keeping it safe and the, the lessons learned to describe there. We've got an excellent communication cascade now and an excellent engagement from all areas in terms of making sure they uh, deliver what they need to. Um, across the piece, we've um, embedded or taken advantage of an opportunity to embed all of our transformational ideas, whether it's in an outpatient environment or whether it's a flow management point of view. Um, so we continue to do that. Um, and likewise, uh, we align ourselves to the system, whether it be with um, acute to acute or acute to community and social care, etc. It is very much a st small steps. Um, so just by way of example, um, we are currently using two of our theatres uh, per day when we're probably using 10 or 12. And from uh, by way of another example, endoscopy, we're probably using 50% of the uh, capacity that we normally have at the minute, uh, but doing that in a very safe way. Um, and then just to make sure that we try and um, keep safety at paramount for our patients is we also use in the independent sector. We have um, certainly operated on some of our um, breast patients from a cancer point of view at Barbara and at Thornbury. So we're trying to make use of all avenues in terms of the resources. Um, I have to just probably say um, one thing, patients are not keen, uh, so as much as we are preparing ourselves to restore, our patients are really not keen to come anywhere near a hospital, so that's, that's quite a challenge, and that's not just a hospital actually, that's minor injury units or primary care in general. So that's the context, Helen uh, and board, um, I'll take any questions um, that you might have. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Oh, Atul, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, Tony, um, you mentioned a few of the things that we're doing differently and that we've learned from from this experience. Um, you know, just the bureaucrat in me yearns for a list of just a list of the things that we think we're doing differently or we want to do differently, um, just to see, you know, in the round uh, where it's got to, basically. That would be helpful. OK, um, in the first instance, at all, I would refer you probably to last month's improvement report. Certainly that covers a lot of the detail, but in terms of a simple list, I will I will uh, I will create something for everyone. Thank you. Angie. 
Thanks, Tony. Uh, just to let board know that we had feedback from region on the systems uh, submission that I shared with you all. Um, and at all, there is something buried. I know it's um, hard to read in there, but there is something that gives the, those areas that we prioritised and picked up on. So um, it's in that slide pack. Uh, the one area that um, region were particularly focused on, in addition to the ones Tony's all, already raised, was around the workforce. Um, and without stating the obvious, I don't think we should lose sight of the impact, uh, picking up Justine's point earlier, um, the, the tiredness of some of our staff, the willingness to go over and beyond uh, again if a second surge comes, um, and the adjustment to different ways of working alongside uh, the returners. We had a lot of interest of people wanting to return, but we've not always taken them up nationally. So there's a, a quite a focus on why is that? Zoe can give you uh, line by line detail on all uh, of our returners by professional group and what we've done with them. And we are working as a system, so we know where um, a member of staff contacted us but couldn't work with us as being able to work in the community, for example, or vice versa. Um, so I just wanted to flag that workforce impact, I say, without stating the obvious that we are incorporating into all our planning and thinking. Thank you, Angie. Uh, Beverly. Thank you, Helen. Hi, Tony. I'm, I'm just thinking you, your comment around patients don't want to come into the hospital. Have we have we had any good practice via RPC that we could share with other GPs in the region? And are we are we keeping those networks open to reassure via the GPs because they will be the referrers? Oh, absolutely. Um, G, I have a GP representative representative on our plan care program that I lead across the system. Uh, Maria only the other day presented to the whole community of uh, primary care in the north. Uh, that was last Friday, just talking through uh, how uh, making them aware of our position and how we can help them and they can help us. And Hal is part of um, the clinical reference group um, that makes sure that we do the right things collectively across the system. Um, and there's lots of messaging from Sarah and Lynn, in terms of the briefs, in terms of encouraging uh, the public to come back uh, and it's OK to approach your NHS provider. So we're seeing that from an urgent point of view. We're seeing the numbers go up presenting at A&E. Uh, but as yet, um, what is being shown is when people have got the choice, I'd like to stay isolated and stay safe as opposed to having my procedure now, I think I'll wait. And it's a little bit of that. And the thing we've just got to be uh, really uh, closely monitoring is it, it isn't one where somebody chooses to wait, which really is a compromise of their care. But what we have done is made sure that uh, our clinicians are assessing all of our patients from a risk point of view and making contact with them on the phone or, or video to make sure they're OK and making appropriate plans for the next steps to look after themselves. Hopefully that answers that query. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I mean, as we've uh, alluded to earlier in the meeting, this is a really important paper, not least of all as our success over this period will be measured not only in our response to COVID positive patients, but in terms of total mortality and clinical outcomes against national and international benchmarks. Um, and, you know, that's that's really what we're aiming for. Um, so whilst on our weekly calls uh, between uh, Ned and Angie, we've had uh, great assurance that there's lots of planning going on. I think it was only really on reading this paper that we could understand the extent and the quality of it. Um, so a big thank you to you, Tony. And I suspect also I detect the fingerprints of Maria Riley um, on various parts of this uh, paper. Um, and it is at her usual quality and um, uh, diligence and we're very grateful to you and her for all your work on this um, it's uh, it's key so thank you um jeremy do you want to come in now uh, yes if i may just quickly and i just wonder what conversations may have been taking place with public health england about the management of any further outbreaks of COVID infection that might be associated either with the hospital itself or with Royal Primary Care. My understanding is that the future arrangements, it's going to be their responsibility to investigate those. 
And have, have, have any conversations happened with public health England about that yet? Yes, quite significant conversations nationally, regionally and locally on that very subject. Um, we went through a phase where, as you rightly say, Jeremy, that traditionally they, they manage the initial outbreak. And certainly from a testing point of view, then they would hand it over to uh, places like ourselves. Um, for a period that went that they handled the lot because it, they had the capacity uh, from a testing point of view and the infrastructure. Um, it's safe to, or not safe to say it, it's, it's variable um, in regions. Um, but the reality is we have an open, good, ongoing dialogue. And I, I pretty much have uh, daily calls in different forums um, discussing their role and how they're supporting us with guidance. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, now, I appreciate we're making good progress down the agenda, but we have two substantive and important items left in addition to some consent and information items. So um, I think we'll take a very short break for anybody who wants to um, a cup of tea or stretch their legs. Uh, we're now on 11.20. If I could ask you to come back um, by 11.25, um, short leg stretch, and we will go straight to the integrated performance report on our return. Thank you. Can I remind everybody to turn the mic and the sound off to mute while we on their break? Thanks, John. an important discussion next on the integrated performance report um, and in time on a tradition and you will introduce it and invite our colleagues to comment on relevant bits of the report. Thanks Helen and a thank you to Clark, Claire Carson and team um, who works for Tony for the report uh, despite additional requests from the centre on Covid reporting this month then Claire has delivered us um, the new format. So I hope everyone um, will feed back their, their comments, but good to see and, and say thank you, Claire, for doing it with the particular challenges this month. I think it does draw attention to those areas that we uh, we really need to have the discussion on. Um, so if I can ask Lynn to kick off from a quality perspective, um, Tony to pick up then on um, performance, uh, Zoe uh, around any workforce issues, and our apologies that we didn't include finance in this month's report in the haste to get it pulled together and with some of the block arrangements. Thank you, Helen, for flagging that. And Lee, I know, is picking that up with Steve. So we will uh, get an even more polished report ready for, for next month. Um, but Lynn, can I keep Just up any highlights you want to do? Lynn, I think the problem we have in finance, Angie, is that there is um, a, a narrative in the summary but the narrative of the summary is it at odds yeah. with the narrative of the finance report. And given the importance of the of the IPR, and not least of all as an audit tool, yeah, yeah, it's really important that those things uh, reflect uh, one version of reality. So I'm assuming that the correct version of reality is the one we've had at item 12 in the finance report, Lee's just given us. Um, so if we note that for the minutes and note that the uh, finance um, section will be updated accordingly that would be really good and that was the context of the time this month so our apologies we will coordinate no. better next month thank you it was a glenn you wanted to go to first please yeah Lynn. thank you sorry i've just uh, got back and um, so i did miss the preempt to that um the summary item in the ipr explains for me the reality section um, how we also want to come in in terms of mortality. Um, but I did want to just mention in terms of the dashboard, because clearly this is the first time that we're all experiencing this new dashboard, and that um, it does highlight for the board areas of significant concern or common cause. Um, and I just think we need to take time to reflect on some of that, particularly in terms of the incident reporting. Um, it identifies that as a, a significant concern, but actually uh, we know that our um, performance in terms of incident reporting is reflective of the fact that we have less patients also coming to the organisation at the moment. Um, but actually performance is being maintained, as I described earlier on in board um, today. Um, but our elements to do with falls in particular, I think we need to pay more focus and more attention to, because clearly that's an area in terms of harms where we're not making the inroads that I would like to. 
you may be aware that we've appointed um, for, on the back of the sequin that we had last year, the falls uh, lead, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to make a consistent measured approach to reduction in falls over the course of the next year. And certainly would be an area for focus for my role moving forward. Um, and, and that was the, the main thing I wanted to just mention today. Thank yeah. you. Hey, all right, if I just come in very briefly on mortality, um, just that the crude mortality is um, showing high. Crude mortality obviously fluctuates an awful lot depending on all sorts of other factors, but I think in this particular case it probably is related to coronavirus itself, um, because obviously we've had a significant number of deaths from that, whilst at the same time having meant many fewer patients in coming through the hospital. Um, reassuringly, both the HSMR and the, the shimmy mortality are, are within expected um, figures. Um, and the only other thing I've just mentioned while I was on is that I think we should, um, whilst the public in general is very um, pro the NHS at the moment, we should take small mercies and note the uh, friends and family score in ED, which was over 90% in April. And I think we should uh, see that as a, a positive thing to reflect on, given all the difficulties we've previously had there. Thank you, Hal. Thanks, Hal. Shall we take questions at the end? So, um, Tony, do you want to carry on on the performance side? Yep. Thank you, Angie. Um, just a couple of points about the report. Uh, um, so my thanks too to Claire and her team. It's been amazing. Um, the intention is only actually to give board um, up to page six in the future. Uh, would welcome your feedback on that uh, and the full report to go to the subcommittees. But again, I'd welcome your thoughts on that. Um, in the because of time constraints, you will note on that uh, overview at the front, the commentary and the data quality sections are missing. They will be there next time. Uh, that's just time running out for Claire with all those other demands on her at the minute. Uh, so they were just uh, uh, a couple of points uh, to you for that. The other point I'd make, just from a technical point of view, we have deliberately not, when you get into the, the meat of the report on the SPC charts, we've deliberately not recalculated limits positive or negative when the trend demands, uh, just so you see the data first time raw, but next report you will see that, and that will evidence the improvement and consolidation of, of some of the work we've done. So they're the technical sort of adverts. Um, from an A&E point of view, um, re really, or the urgent care pathway, uh, really good uh, sort of statistics in terms of uh, the performance from a four hour point of view. Uh, it's ahead of the recovery trajectory that we put in place a couple of months ago. Uh, and you can see the ramping up of the performance um, as time goes by. So really pleased with that. As we go through the organisation, our occupancy, we're deliberately operating at low occupancies, uh, uh, whether it's in our normal wards or in our COVID wards. And our, uh, one of our favourites, over, over 21 days, um, we've got single figure numbers now as we stand today. There's about 20 at the point of this report, but... We're in single figures at the minute. So that's a, as a consequence of working really well with our partners uh, in community and social care. Uh, so very pleased with that. So that's from an A&E point of view. 18 weeks, um, a bit of a gem really, although you might not look it on first uh, look because you go, oh, we've got four 52-week breaches. Um, but considering um, the delays uh, from a surgical point of view or treatment point of view, um, there are hundreds in the system elsewhere, hundreds, uh, but we positioned our um, waiting list, if you recall, uh, down at the 36 to 40 week range. Um, so really profiled really well. Um, so I'm not surprised we've got four. They're all COVID related uh, in terms of choices by patients. Um, equally not surprising that the performance drifts downwards because there was significant reduction in the number of referrals coming into the hospital. So you've got nothing to counterbalance the numbers currently on the waiting list that are drifting because we haven't uh, done any treatment on anyone. So to hold it at that position and still to the clinicians completely reviewing the waiting list, it is in a really good shape um, numerically compared to the start of the year as well. 
And from a cancer point of view, uh, yeah, there's been all sorts of things uh, that have stopped, you know, from a diagnostics point of view. Uh, there's a big challenge around two week referral now because um, the guidance is you're going to have to isolate for two weeks from the point of referral before coming in. So you'll immediately breach. We've held our own. Uh, the, the SBC charts show for the 28 day faster diagnosis. We've held quite a stable position in the high 70s which is remarkable considering um, how we're, you know, the current climate we're in. Um, and then you'll see the impact as you go through the pathways, clearly um, with those delays of treatment and patients choosing not to be treated, um, then you've seen the drift in terms of impact on 62 day and obviously a crease, increase in the 104 day breaches, which are, are reviewed as normal. Uh, we still have the issue I mentioned earlier about reluctance of patients to attend, um, and I would still draw people's attention to the excellent consolidation of the, uh, the virtual approach in terms of our patients. So I'll draw breath there, Helen, on that point. Very good. Um, in which so, case, yeah, we just go to Zoe and then I'll come to you, Beverly, after that. Thank you, Helen. A couple of areas I'd like to comment on. Firstly, sickness absence to give both the latest position. So over the last two weeks, our overall sickness absence has ranged between 10 and 11 percent on our daily sit rep. Um, you'll recall before we each day we submit our um, sickness figures of that between 6.1 to 7.1 percent has been COVID related each day. And that's either been sickness or self isolating related. Uh, that is a, a slight improvement. The two weeks prior to that was more the kind of 11 to 12 percent mark. So slight improvement. Um, and Monday's figure, which is the latest one we have, was slightly below 10 percent. But that's that's only one day. And so I wouldn't say that constitutes a trend. Um, but certainly the 10 to 11 percent has been consistent over the last two weeks prior to this one. Um, the second area I'd just like to comment on is essential training. So board colleagues know we've been doing lots of work, lots of hard work to um, try and improve our essential training compliance. We've introduced various different approaches to doing that, um, some of which we've been able to continue during COVID, some of which we obviously haven't. Um, I'm pleased to say that we've continued to see some small increases in essential training compliance, um, even during the COVID situation so far. So April we were at 83%, which whilst not at the 90% target, is certainly getting closer towards it. Um, we are taking, ensuring that people are taking the opportunities to complete their essential training while they can during this period. So, for example, if people are from working at home and have the capacity to do so, we do have a lot of the modules which you can do via e-learning. Clearly, compliance will be varying at the moment depending on capacity and job roles and what's happening in different areas, etc. Um, but overall, we are seeing an improving picture. Thank you, Zoe. Um, Beverly. Thank you, Helen. Um, question for Zoe and or, or Lynn, really. Um, I mean, we get our weekly updates on staff absence and it, it's been not as bad as perhaps we might have thought it could be. But then when we drill down into the nursing figures at 17 percent, I just wonder if you can give some background, because obviously not only worried about COVID, but work related stress, etc. So if you could just explain some of those figures. So, so the 17 percent, sorry, what, where are we looking? Sorry. Nursing, nursing vacancies. 17%. Vacancies, sorry. I thought sorry. I was the reasons, the reasons I for the vacancies. Sickness, apologies, Beverly. I was, um, I was looking at my daily sit rep from the nursing. You know, it's not 17 percent, it's much lower than that. Um, some of our plans around um, nursing recruitment have been affected due to COVID, so particularly international recruitments. Um, we did have a cohort start joined us in March um, and they have been progressing. We were due to have another cohort join in June, so, so shortly, um, another 20 nurses, which obviously that's been delayed with borders being closed, etc. So we do, we will, that will still happen, um, but we're not completely clear on the timescales as yet. So that has an impact. Um, we, to, to think to plan, unless Lynn knows different any changes in the last few days um, in terms of our newly qualified recruitment is kind of still still progressing through. Um, clearly, that happens at particular times in the year as well. Uh, so I would say that international recruitment is the thing that's had the biggest impact in terms of numbers we were planning on a few months ago, not being able to join us at the time we wanted them to. 
Sorry, no, I'm talking about percentage of the workforce vacant among the nursing staff. Yes, yeah, yeah, so sorry, I was have... talking about plans to recruit to those. No, I'm assuming that it says percentage, nursing percentage of workforce vacant, 17%, and I'm asking about the reasons for absence. There's a varying array of reasons for the absence in that totality, Beverly, a combination of staff who are off sick post-surgery, staff who have got short-term sickness and absence, staff who have got isolating because family members are sick, staff who are sick themselves, and uh, Zoe gave you the percentage of COVID specific, which was about 7%. It has fluctuated. It's been as high as 12, I think, at one point. I can't, I can't remember exactly, but it's, it's fluctuated. Yeah. And that varies depending on what stage the, what stage we've been at in terms of the lockdown or the release of the lockdown. And I'm thinking now, what's it going to be like as we move forward? Um, and also, we, we um, some staff who were shielding had not all received a letter and then got more of a letter. We've started the risk assessment. So that will fluctuate a bit. Um, in that totality of why staff are off sick. And I think, percent that, sorry, Karen, I was going to say, I think we're getting a, a little bit confused. Um, I, I think I am, apologies. Uh, the, the heading of the graph, Jeremy's put a comment in the, um, the chat box, which I think is helpful. So the heading percentage of workforce vacant, that's actually um, vacant against establishment. So it's not around sickness absence vacant, it's around fund, funded establishments. Um, so we were at a level with nursing recruitment where we were in a really in a strong position um, and then for positive reasons. So for we made a deci decision as a board to increase investment in nurse staffing. So at night, for example, and in other areas which increased our vacancy numbers. Um, and that's what that 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 graph is showing. I think perhaps it's not very clear in the report. So we perhaps need to yeah. need to look at that. Yeah, so that's why I was getting confused. So do we do we have any significant absence um, stress related that we're aware of? Well, it's anxiety and stress related is consistently as it is across the NHS one of the one of the reasons for sickness absence. If you look at it kind of sort of top three, top four, um, it would be consistently. Um, and I think that's why we've talked about the, you know the support we have got as a as a nation essentially, which we're keeping a close eye on here and working with Ken and the charity too in terms of what support the charity can bring is really, really important. So yeah, that is absolutely a factor. So the, the, the where number, which we reflect back to staff story earlier on, Beverly, we did see a number of staff go off at that point in time where the women's health unit element was involved and that came back and, and all those staff are back at work and now. Um, with regards to COVID, there hasn't been a specific stress related sickness related to that that I'm aware of. I also just want to go back to that vacancy figure because we took a report to Quality Assurance Committee um, at the start of the month as well, which looked at what our current nursing vacancy was with regards to band five and six level. And the prediction of that coming down to as low as seven, six percent in September, October, when the students come in as well. So it's just to give you a bit of um, whilst we might be a bit confused about what the graph is saying, giving you both six absences and the vacancy information together. Okay, Ashfall, please. Yes, can I can I just welcome the the new format of the report? I think uh, uh, it's 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 really really helpful, particularly for me, um, to get a grip on things, both the uh, the dashboard and the detail. <clears throat> and I would hope, my guess is that governors and members of the public would also uh, find this this format of the report. Uh, very much useful. So thank you to Tony and the team. I know obviously there have been other pressures um, uh, around this time, but to start off the new financial year with the new format uh, is really great. For what it's worth, I think for the next couple of meetings at least, I would prefer to have the detail uh, coming to us uh, until we get used to it all. Thank you. <clears throat> um, we've had a similar comment from Sue, Tony. So I think huge thanks to you and Claire Carson for the uh, format. The SPC charts are particularly um, informative. Um, I appreciate your suggestion that the board might want to concentrate on the first six pages and certainly they're in a format now that uh, will support and help good quality board scrutiny. But I think as Atul and Sue uh, have expressed we will stick with the full report coming to board despite the scrutiny it's getting at committees in advance of that, at least initially, 
until we all get um, used to the um, new layout and um, um, used to interrogating it and all the value that that new format is going to bring us. Um, we also note um, the very good performance across all areas despite the uh, current challenges um, and are not complacent about the challenges we still have. Um, not least of all, um, the ongoing challenge in A&E despite the uh, reduced pressure on the service and uh, the steps that uh, Tony and colleagues are taking around uh, cancer performance, which as sure as night follows day will translate into cancer outcomes if we're not very careful to do everything we can to um, maintain and improve uh, cancer performance over this period. So thank you all for that. Um, and that now brings us on, if we may, to um, the last substantive item of the morning, which is the Infection Prevention and Control um, Assurance Report. So if we go to you, Lynn, please. Thank you very much. Um, the, in fact, the government, uh, through the gov.uk, but essentially working with the NHS ID, have developed a COVID assurance dashboard for um, infection prevention control. It's a 10 point plan, essentially. This first came out in one version and um, I've subsequently had another version since this has even been completed. So this is the third iteration of that dashboard and uh, framework that's been published. So this is the assurance against the systems because the first iteration, and I've no doubt you'll see further ones before, um, before too long, um, as it is a moving, a moving situation as we learn more. But what I want to provide to board today is with regards to this particular element, it does relate to the Health and Social Care Act, particularly with relation to infection control. So it is in statute. And it, the, the issues that have been applied that are different is more the scrutiny or the frequency and the level of cleaning, for example, um, and social distancing. So the new thing. So some of it is in, in existence already and some of it is new. You can see from the actual dashboard, page three of the report, that we are providing um, a RAG rating to mm. that based on our levels of assurance and our professional judgment against the hygiene code, um, of which there are uh, predominantly green assurance to that. There's three years where we haven't quite yet finished off our, our checking of those processes. But as I say, this is a, a progressive document and the latest version that came out on the 22nd of May has got some more elements to it about frequency of cleaning that we're still working through in terms of the impact of that on the on the wards and, and areas and other aspects. We do take this into consideration, as Tony has referenced, when we are looking at recovery plans, um, because examples of cleaning more frequently in between patients, lying fallow with rooms between the movement of cases through theatre, for example, all impact on our recovery process. But I would like to commend today to board that we are, can provide a good um, level of, uh, well, a significant level of assurance around our infection control practices. I, I do say that on the basis that we've also know that um, we've had CQC visit to ED back in December. We're just awaiting our final publication of our CQC report. And infection control practice is an area that we know um, does flag up within there. Sometimes smaller elements to it, sometimes um, more detail, as we saw in ED. Um, it is reassuring to know that actions we've taken in ED have been progressed and are, are, are doing well. But I do think this is an area we need to focus on. And certainly when looking at the bath, I'll be putting more in with regards to infection control into the bath moving forward, um, because it does need a bit of a spotlight on it um, in terms of its leadership within the organisation in the clinical areas, um, particularly um, ensuring that we deliver practice our education training around infection control is strong. It is consistent application of the right thing that needs the attention. Um, that said, um, I've got good assurances on these key areas with some still work to do and a revised version that we just need to make sure we were up to with that revised version of the framework that's come out from the NHS. Thank you, Lynn. Um, do colleagues want to come in on this item? If you do, please, if you could indicate. Um, 
in which case then I think we're very grateful for the actions you've put in train uh, and it's good to hear about the further checks that have been done against later iterations of the document. Um, I'd like to say that I think when you put this paper alongside the earlier paper on quarterly quality report, it just goes to show the calibre and the quality of attention on clinical governance. Um, nothing less than we would expect, Lynn, but when you're in a crisis situation, sometimes those sort of things slip and inevitably they cause mayhem in due course. Uh, but not only has your usual standards been maintained, but if anything, I would say there's been an increased focus um, on clinical governance, which I'm sure will stand uh, very well now and in the fullness of time. So a big thank you to you and your colleagues who've been involved. It's uh, it's a measure of the general quality with which we do things, but is hugely visible and evidenced at this time in these ways. So thank you. Thank you. I will add, Helen, that um, to come out of COVID, it, is, uh, it will be our standards of infection prevention control that do support us to deliver safe care for our patients moving forward. So that's, that's what's been at the heart of driving these measures is to help us to continue to deliver safe care for our patients as we go back through into our recovery plans. And I know my executive colleagues are on the same page as I am with that. Well done. Thank you. Um, at item 16, we have a number of consent items. I haven't had um, any um, advance notification that any board member colleagues want to raise anything. Um, so we will take those as agreed by consent. Um, before we come to any other business, if I can just ask you to note the items for information set out at um, agenda item 18. Um, and then that will bring me back to um, any other business. Does anybody want to raise any items of any other business? Which wouldn't appear so, in which case the next meeting um, is on the 29th of July. I'm assuming, Lynn, that that meeting on the 29th of July will be your last board meeting. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I'm not worried about that answer, but I would have been more worried about the answer. No, you'll have missed the boat. I'm going on the 28th. So we know we have at least that opportunity, if not further ones, to thank you possibly for your uh, contribution. So that's that was the purpose of my inquiry. Um, so on that note, if we can just uh, review this um, meeting, please. Um, first thing I'd like to say is I'm conscious that we've had nine uh, members of the public um, dial in. Um, we don't know who they are. This new format we've used today um, doesn't let us see who you are, so there's no discourtesy being attended, no discourtesy being um, uh, 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 intended in terms of us not doing the usual introductions or proper hello. Um, uh, so we're glad you're out there. We've also been advised by our IT colleagues that there's been some difficulty broadcasting the video as well as the audio. So if it's been like a kind of version of Radio 4 beaming into your kitchen or sitting room or study this morning, apologies. I think we've managed some video. I know it's easier to engage with when you've got video and audio. Um, so uh, just to uh, say we will be taking further steps to try and get better and better at this as we go on, not least of all um, with the uh, restoration and recovery programme and getting back to normal, it'll be a great additional um, service to be able to offer those who want to be involved but not um, necessarily free to come in person. So we'll keep on at that. Um, so just going around the table, so to speak, um, I might come to people actually in the order in which I can see you on this screen, which is probably different for everybody. Can I start with you, Jeremy, um, in terms of uh, how is it for you today? Uh, I think it's been very well managed and obviously timing has been impeccable. Um, I think we've had some useful conversations about important issues. It's been a, it's been a good meeting. Thank you. Zoe? Yeah, I think it's flowed well today. And despite initially when we all logged on, it felt like we were going to have too many technical problems. And that was going to be a bit of an issue, but I think we've, over, we've overcome that. And I think, yeah, I think it's flowed well today. Very good. Jane? 
Thank you, Helen. Um, I'd just like to say, I think it's been really a really good meeting and I do think that people have got adequate opportunity to ask the questions that they need to ask. So I think it's it, we're still able to probe with the areas that we need to probe. So well done. Very good. Lynn? Uh, I'm just glad my, my IT continued to stay positive for me, which was great. Um, and I, I, I felt that it, I felt more comfortable with the process than I had anticipated. So I think it has been cheered well and worked well as a result of that. Thank you. Keith? Yeah, no, very good meeting, I think. And like Jane, I think good opportunity um, to ask questions. I think Im impeccably chaired, Helen, I would say, because it's not easy to do these. I do these in a day job and it's not easy. Um, but I think also we shouldn't miss the fact that we have live streamed this, which is a very big step forward to do that. I appreciate audio only today, um, but uh, the principle is there. And I think that sets a, uh, an interesting standard going forward for how we do this in, in, a, in, a, in a slightly changed world. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Helen. Yes, ex excellent papers. And as always, credit to the exec team that they're pulling this all together with faced with all the additional challenges. So all in all, very good meeting. Well chaired, Helen. Thank you. Atul. Yes, I, I disagree with everybody uh, that's gone before me. I'd just like to add one thing, and that's to do with the staff story and perhaps, you know, Mayor Culper. Um, I just felt that I think we should have given a bit more feedback to them that we are hearing what they say. Thank you to Jane for saying it really on our behalf and you, Helen, for uh, wrapping it up very well. But I would like them to feel that, you know, we have heard it and maybe I should have said something more and maybe we should all have said a bit more about that. Perhaps that message could get back to them. That would be really grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Atul. Now, I'm just about to come to the people I can't see, but before I do that, um, um, Ian Hazel has just reminded us on the chat very helpfully that for those of you who have been um, observers to this call, you can actually give us some feedback about how it was from you if you can find the Q&A box. Um, so if you find your Q&A box and want to put in a line or two about how the meeting's been for you, that will be uh, much appreciated and we'll then come to that once I've just uh, finished off with colleagues around the table. So Hal next, please. Um, so, so I think um, gen generally a good meeting. The only thing um, on a slightly um, negative note is that we obviously did, between us all, have some IT problems um, and sometimes the technology doesn't quite allow us to have the meeting flowing freely. So um, on occasion, certain people are breaking up and then we, we lose what's saying. So whilst it's obviously a great advance compared to where we were several months ago. We, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, OK, thank you, Hal. Tony? From my point of view, I echo all the comments that have been made. Um, really good chairmanship, uh, Helen, in these difficult uh, ways of working. Um, some of the technology is still to work on, Ian, from a point of view of the corporate meeting room, uh, but I think the content and the discussion are really good. Thank you, Tony. Alison? Hi, Helen. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, to make a comment. Um, a very good meeting, and I'd particularly like to reference the IPR and seeing the data in a new format, which actually gives us a, a, a better highlight of, um, of issues that we might want to discuss, which was the whole purpose of developing the, the uh, the statistical uh, process control methodology. So, um, so thank you to Tony and the team for that. I think it leads to a better conversation. Here, here. Thank you, um, Mike. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd echo Bev's comments about the quality of the executive reports, given the uh, the pressure the guys are under, but also Hal's comment that you know the IT was a bit clunky today. So, uh, if we can get that better, it will be a uh, super. But all in all, a really good meeting. Thank you, Mike. Sue. Yes, I'd echo that. I think it's a um, mine's a bit like Atul's comment, really. Whilst I think this works really well, it's chaired really well, we get a chance to comment properly. We do miss a little bit of that, even just the staff story, them being able to see us all and get our body language and our response. And of course, that's just a, a, a facet of working on teams. Um, so we maybe just need to think about that and make sure that we do speak up. 
um, even if just to, to all of us to say thank you. I think we probably feel we shouldn't just say the uh, the throwaway comments, but maybe we should, especially when staff are um, on the call with us. Um, and I don't think I'd realised until just now that the chat doesn't become part of the public record. Um, and I think we just need to be sh be careful if we want to say something like I agree or I consent that we say it verbally rather than chat, because if it's missed, that just might be a governance issue for me. Um, but no, I think it's been a great meeting and I echo again. I'm delighted with the new IPR format and really looking forward to that helping us guide some of our um, scrutiny. So thank you. Thanks, Helen. And last but by no means least, how are it for you, Angie? Um, loved being your assistant yes. and only failed to unmute once, so apologies at all, but I did it really quickly, hopefully. Um, I, I think that my observation around last month, it felt like we deferred quite a lot and with a couple of notable exceptions when I saw uh, Gillian's little um, cars that she does for us in terms of items we've deferred. Um, there's only a couple now that we almost need to catch back up. So I think um, credit to colleagues for, for getting us back to what feels like a normal meeting while still in that COVID context and looking forward to our first um, more informal strategic session next month with some food for thought I think out of today as well. Very good. Well we've got some, um, we know who some of our observers today are. Denise says good meeting, thank you Denise and hello to you. Judith says good meeting but echoes the comments around sound quality so apologies but we are going to try and uh, crack this one. And similarly from Kate, good meeting, but audio breaking up occasionally. Um, so we will do what we can to get a kind of more seamless experience going for now and of course also for the future. So um, a huge thank you to um, all of my board member colleagues for today, uh, to the executive for the quality of the papers in these difficult times, to my NED colleagues for the diligence with which they've read them and the preparations were made so we could have a really good discussion. And as ever, for those who've taken the time to dial in, it's much appreciated. And um, and uh, we look forward to the facility to be able to at least see you out there in the not too distant future. So a very big thank you. And um, we'll um, close the link.